All right, hello everyone. Can everyone hear me all right? All right, well, thank you so much for joining us tonight for another current Associates of Science event uh, presented by staff, my work knowledge, and assistance. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Brendan River. I am the lead reporter for ADAPT, which is a digital first project from WJCC Public Media and the Action of Today focused on climate change, how it's impacting Northeast Florida and West Coast County. Um, and if you're interested in getting original in-depth reporting on climate change and learning about other events like this, you can sign up for our newsletter after the event at adaptforward.org. Um, my co-moderator tonight is Chris Allison. Uh, he is a keen and distinguished professor of art history here at Fisher College. Uh, Chris and his students, two of them sitting right here next to me, uh, they came to me with the idea for this event, for this partnership. Um, and Chris and his wife, Julie, who isn't here with us tonight, uh, she runs the Chris Ellis Museum. Uh, they really made all of this possible, so I really want to thank you guys for all the work that you did. So this is a really cool, exciting event for me. <laughs> um, and some, some quick general housekeeping before uh, we get into things. Um, starting around 8 or so, we will open the floor up for questions from you all. Um, so please just kind of stay seated and, and keep quiet until then. Uh, make sure your phones are on silent if you have them with you. Um, and we do have people who are watching virtually and will be able to take questions from you as well. Uh, so if you have quest questions, you can just type them out in the uh, YouTube chat window as you're watching. Um, and if your question is for a specific panelist, please just make sure to include your name so they know to answer. You can hear me. All right. Yeah. More? Closer? Thanks, everyone, for being here. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, WJCT and Dr. Brendan, um, for, for collaborating, um, especially my students. Uh, I'm joined by, a, a, I think, a prestigious panel. Uh, some of my favorite people on campus are included here tonight. Um, uh, I'll introduce each of our panelists. Uh, we're joined by Barbara Blonder, who just wrapped up her 19th year as a full-time professor in natural sciences in the natural sciences department at Flagler College. Her current research focuses on coastal dunes and how things like storms and sea level rise are affecting those ecosystems and the animals that call them home. Barbara also has been a member of the St. Augustine City Commission since 2020. We also have Lori Lee up here with us. Lori is a Keenan Distinguished Associate Professor of Anthropology at Flagler College, and her research focuses on materiality, memory, and medical practices of African-American and indigenous cultures. Her work also explores how climate change and human activity are impact impacting cultural heritage. Leah Sandler joins us today from Orlando. Thanks for, for coming. She's an interdisciplinary artist and writer and one of the 10 artists featured in the Undercurrents exhibition. Her work has been featured in exhibits across the country and she's the author of the Center for Post-Capitalist History's Field Guide to Embodied Archiving which was published by Borough Press last year. And finally, two very impressive Flagler College students on stage with us, um, who along with their um, colleagues in my curatorial studies class helped to plan the Undercurrents exhibition. Katie Letterer is a graphic design and photographer, graphic designer, <laughs> not a graphic design, a graphic designer and photographer who just graduated magna cum laude from Flagler with a BA in art history and a BA in graphic design. Congratulations. <laughs> During her time at uh, Flagler, Katie received several awards and scholarships, including Distinguished Student Award for the Art History Department and Best of Show at Flagler's Graphic Design Portfolio Show. Shelby Fox is a St. Augustine, Florida native and an upcoming, upcoming senior at Flagler, double majoring in public history and art history and minoring in anthropology. Shelby is a member of the National Historical National Historical Honor Society, I have that right? And after, after graduating, she plans to pursue her master's and doctorate in art history. So thank you all for being here tonight. Thanks for coming. Okay, and uh, did you all get the chance to check out the exhibit before coming over? Yeah, most of you did. I'm seeing mostly affirmative head nods. Okay, good. Um, so I, I know the exhibit's fresh in everyone's mind because you were just over there, uh, but I always like to start these conversations out by, by talking about 
climate change and, and how it's impacting whatever region we're discussing. Uh, because that really kind of sets the baseline for the conversation going forward. So having said that, Barbara, uh, I'd like to start with you. So as most of you probably know, uh, climate change is something that uh, St. Augustine City Commission is, is paying very close attention to uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and when you compare it to other local governments in our region and across the state, really, St. Augustine's kind of ahead of the, the curve, really. They're doing a lot around here to deal with this issue. So, so, Barbara, why is climate change such an important issue to St. Augustine? Well, it hasn't, it, is this working? Can you guys hear her? Yeah, okay. Um, first of all, thank you all for being here. I think it's um, part of why St. Augustine is um, so uh, committed to dealing with resilience issues and making a, our city more resilient is because of the, um, the interest that students have in preserving this wonderful place and the natural communities here as well. Um, but why is St. Augustine so keen on this issue? Hasn't rained in a while, but if it had, um, we'd be, we'd all be, I'd be wearing my um, my waders, my you know my knee boots, um, because as you know, um, this street right in front of us, Sevilla. If any of you have been here very long, if it rains even half an inch, it pretty much floods. We're um, we are, as the city manager likes to say. Um, I think Miami is at 11 feet above sea level and we're at eight feet. So if you think Miami has problems, um, think about three feet less. So um, I'm not great at memorizing numbers like that even though I'm a scientist, but it's somewhere in that ballpark. So we really have issues with um, especially sea level rise and more intense rainstorms, more intense storms in general. Um, for all the reasons that are, you know, contributing to climate change and contributing to um, warmer atmosphere, warmer warmer atmospheres hold more water, and so we get a lot more water coming down from skies, and then we also get a lot more water coming up through sea level rise. So we, we're getting hit in both directions. And can you tell us a little bit about your research as it relates to these issues? Yeah, um, I could tell you a lot about it, <laughs> and I've just been really fortunate to um, be awarded a research sabbatical to spend the fall semester really focused on it, but um, it's, a, a, it's a continuing research. I really went out, I used to be in fire ecology, um, oddly enough I worked for the Nature Conservancy before coming here, um, so I'm, I'm really interested in ecosystems and the um, what we call disturbances, so storms, floods, um, even if you want to say volcanoes, I mean, any kind of disturbance that can change an ecosystem, set it back, including human disturbances. And so I originally started looking at, I see a couple of my um, colleagues over there in the GTM Research Reserve, um, at the fire ecology out there in the dune ecosystem, which wasn't well known. And then as um, part, corollary to that, I also used to work on gopher tortoises um, in my previous life as well. So we were out there and saw a lot of gopher tortoises and go for tortoise burrows, so we mapped those, and then boom, we got two hurricanes in a row, Matthew and Irma. Uh, and so that presented us with a real opportunity to see how the gopher tortoises in that ecosystem responded. Did they get washed away? Did they get entombed in their burrows? Or were they climbing up to the tops of the dunes and riding it out? We really weren't sure. So um, that was the research I just completed and published in a year ago or so. Um, and then on top of that, those hurricanes also gave us the opportunity to think about what they eat. They're herbivores, they're vegetarians, and all of their food got pretty much buried um, with both of those storms. And so that's the research I'm working on right now. Gopher tortoises are keystone species, which means they harbor as many as, or up to, in um, uh, 350, I believe, known other species that live in their burrows. And so they're critical to the ecosystems in which they live. They recycle nutrients. Uh, and um, they're getting ready, the eastern population of gopher tortoises is getting ready to go on the endangered species list. Um, too little, too late, but better late than never. And so that should happen this year. And what we don't know, we know what the inland populations eat, but we have no idea what they're eating out in the coastal dunes. Um, and those are really important um, uh, populations. They're experiencing all of the pressures from human development because where do we like to live on the coast? Um, we like to build our roads there. And so they're experiencing those pressures. They're getting squeezed between A1A and, oops, I'm sorry, and, um, uh, and sea level rise. So that's really what my research is about, is looking at those ecosystems and how 
we can help manage those species and ensure their survival over the, over the future. Very cool. And, and so, Lori, I want to go to you now because um, here in St. Augustine, one of the reasons I, I've been told by many people that, that climate change is such an issue is because it is a huge threat to the cultural resources here, which are very important to the local economy. Uh, and so, so to start, I'm not, I'm not sure everyone knows what cultural resources is, means in this specific context. Um, so, so can you kind of explain why, what that is, uh, and kind of go into what, how, what kind of impact climate change is having here and what's being done about it? Yeah, I, I'm not very loud, so <laughs> can you all hear me? Okay, so um, cultural resources um, are include the tangible and intangible aspects of the human past. Um, so these would be things like buildings and structures, but also include things like landscapes um, and resources for science. Um, so cultural resources are a really critical component of the ecosystem that Barb Blonder was just talking about, right? So obviously in St. Augustine, which is known um, for being um, the oldest city in the United States, uh, cultural resources are very important and tangible, right? So in thinking about cultural resources and the impact of sea level rise and climate change on cultural resources, there are a whole series of questions that we have to take into consideration. So again, my primary research interests are working with African diaspora communities and indigenous communities. Um, and we know that, so if you were walking around looking at the tables before you came over here and you saw the Florida Public Archaeology Network table and they have a list of sites, um, uh, critical sites um, that are most well known in the Northeast region. And they're almost all right along the coast. Right, And a lot of those are things like Fort Mose, the first legally sanctioned free black settlement in, the, in what became the United States, um, Nombre de Dios, Fountain of Youth, all of these things that are really um, early examples of multicultural communities, right? In addition to the indigenous past. So we're interested in looking at the intersection of those with the impact of climate change. A lot of those sites too, if you've if you're from St. Augustine, um, the Castillo San Marcos that bring in lots of visitors and lots of money to our economy are right on the coast. Um, and as Barb Blonder was saying, um, if it rains, <laughs> I, so one of our students last semester, you could tell it was their first semester, they sent me an email in week one of class and they said, if it rains, do we have class? And I thought, oh, you're not from here, are you? And um, I'm not from here either. This is my eighth year in Florida, but you learn quickly that yes, we do have class, and yes, it means you wear waders. Um, but I'm interested in the cultural impacts, of, so, so sort of the cultural reasons behind that. So looking at um, the cultural resources and landscapes and helping people understand how these things are interconnected. So for example, where we're sitting right now at Flagler College, um, was a hotel, as you know, built by Henry Flagler, industrial railroad mag magnate. But in order to develop this property, and he was a developer, he needed to fill in the northern part of Maria Sanchez Creek because this area would flood. So he did that by purchasing some land um, and dredging that land. And that land is where Fort Mose is today. So um, you've got land from this uh, so people say, why don't you do excavations on campus? Well, it's disturbed land, right? Um, and then the impacts of that, because one of the projects that I'm working on is at Fort Mose, um, there, there is a creek that is a result of that dredging that's impacting and has eroded away what was the southwest corner of the second fort that was occupied out there. Um, so we're, we're seeing impacts of, of human impacts and climate change coming together to result in critical impacts to our important sites, right? So Fort Mose, for example, will be underwater. Um, it's estimated within 50 years. So part of um, my own research is to um, look at impacts of climate change uh, in St. Augustine, both at Port Mose and at GTM NUR as well. So I'm part of a project there that's looking at um, 
is, is trying to test out this model that's been developed by my collaborative research team, which includes Florida Public Archaeology Network um, and a number of researchers from several different institutions. Um, the lead of that project is Sarah Miller, project lead, um, who is the Northeast Director of FPN, Emily Jane Murray, um, is the collaborative lead. So it's a collaborative science grant that is um, looking at how do we uh, work with stakeholders, right? So how do we work with, for example, we're working with the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage um, Corridor, and we're working with the Seminole to make sure that we're helping, um, that we're not just going out there for research purposes and finding out what we want to know, but how do we protect these sites? How do we identify these sites? Um, who becomes aware of these sites, uh, who has access to that information of where they're located, um, and how does this information um, help the people at GTM NUR interpret the past, the peoples of Guana Preserve, right? So um, all of that coming together in terms of looking at those sites and discovering which ones are most at risk by going out and very carefully documenting with um, arrow golds the, with one centimeter precision, how the coastline is eroding over time. Um, using predictive modeling developed by Dr. Lindsay Co Cochran at um, East Tennessee State University, right? So a, a very large collaborative partnership between researchers across several states, um, looking at how we can test out this model that we've developed at GTM NUR, and can this be applicable to other um, NUR properties, right? So that's one of the things that I've been involved in. All right, very cool. Um, and, and so I want to turn things over to the students now. I'm very glad you two were able to join us. Uh, so Katie and Shelby, uh, your generation is very vocal about climate change. Why do you think that is? And, and Katie, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Shelby. Um, so the term climate change is, I guess, a fairly new term. I see like a lot of different ages across the board and it used to be called global warming. And then before that, it was keep America or keep America beautiful. Um, but we're really the first generation to have fully lived in the climate crisis and not really known anything else. And um, we're going to be the ones to deal with it, with the decisions of the past. So. <laughs> well, and going with off of what Katie was saying is our generation, we're looking towards the future for us and as well as our future generations growing up. We want to be able to live in a place that we know will still be here in 50 years. Um, so it, it's very important to us because we would like to have a future and have maybe our future kids know and recognize species and climates as well as environments that we know and cherish today. I think I remember hearing someone refer to the climate crisis as a ball of tape. Like it was broken, and then one generation slapped a piece of tape over it, the next slapped a piece of tape over it, and they just passed it to us and said, Good luck, guys. <laughs> so. um, and as, as someone who is, is regularly reading about climate change and writing about it, it can be pretty disheartening. Do you, do you two feel like you're optimistic about the situation or no? No. <laughs> Um, with the way corporations control means of production and with the way populations are going, I'm not super optimistic. Every like greenwashing attempt that's gone on, it's just done more damage. Um, I'm sure everyone remembers the crying Native American riding a horse over a mound of trash, but they probably don't know that that entire campaign was funded by Coca-Cola because they didn't want their logo associated with litter. And then Al Gore tried to popularize the term global warming, but turning off your light bulb isn't going to save anything when they're pouring billions and tons of trash into the ocean every year. Well, and going off that, growing up in northeast Florida, you know, you read news articles and investigative journalistic articles that go into corporations here in this region, and you hear that they're using loopholes, which we also have a piece, if you saw, called loophole, so it's kind of <laughs> ironic. But we see loopholes that these corporations are using to get away with things such as dumping toxins into, for example, the St. John River. And so even at home, you see these issues. And when it, it hits that hard, you're like, wow, then this is going across the nation, if not the world. So I'm not too optimistic, but I do know that our generation is going to try the best we can. Yeah. So I was reading in one of the books from our curated library at the exhibition 
Over the past thousand years, 50% uh, of all trees on Earth have been cut down, and in the past 100 of year, 100 years, uh, that makes up 75% of the trees that were cut down. Okay. Not very stoked about that. <laughs> I hate um, to be downers. Yeah, sorry guys. <laughs> well, well, on that note, let's let's talk about art. Let's talk about yeah. something a little more uplifting. <laughs> as of Chris. <laughs> Maybe I'm, I'm I'm recalling many debates in our classroom about <laughs> my relative pessimism and my students' <laughs> optimism. Um, so maybe I've turned you somehow. Uh, so to give you some context on just like the exhibition project, um, so I teach a class called Curatorial Studies, right? In which the the idea is like we talk about the theory of putting together exhibitions, and then we put together an exhibition. Um, so this particular exhibition. The genesis was like last fall, I had a couple um, research assistants uh, and we were thinking about like flooding as a kind of motif in art history. Um, and we were just, you know, kind of thinking through different ideas of how to approach this like uh, as a research project. Um, and then I went to my, my colleague, Patrick Moser, who's in the back uh, taking my picture currently, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, who was organizing the Finger Mullet Film Festival. And I was like, well, what if what if my class put together an exhibition, right, sort of like involving film and photo and video uh, sort of in, in collaboration? Um, so in the fall, we developed this kind of call for artists um, on the theme of, of flooding. Uh, and then spring semester, I think we, you know, I want to say we had like 125 submissions of film, video, photographic work, um, you know, all kinds of all kinds of things. I mean, it really run. It was up and down, right? The uh, the spectrum. Um, and yeah, and then basically sort of like hand everything off to my students and then manage a kind of three ring circus um, to like get get to the end of the semester um, and and the results, right? Like everything we see in the exhibit, including this event, right, is is because of their organization, right? And just their, their thoughtfulness. Um, so I wanted to ask them a question. What did you work on? What was your favorite part? <laughs> So I was part of the curatorial team, and basically what I worked on when you look, go into the exhibit is the main text when you walk in that kind of sets the thematic um, representation of the exhibition and kind of gets you in that mindset looking at all of the different pieces. Um, that was actually a lot of fun, I'll be honest, because that's kind of what I'm looking to do when I graduate and get out of postgraduate school. Um, is to really, I guess, do exactly what our class does. And I just, I enjoyed the whole process, honestly, seeing it come together, seeing your own writing with your fellow classmates actually posted in an actual exhibition was probably one of the most exciting things to see all that hard work come true, you know, and look amazing. And um, yeah, but I was also really excited about what you kind of worked on with design, so. Yeah, so we kind of divided up the class into different departments, and I was on the graphic design department and worked on the branding. I made the little booklets that are, the little zines that are in the exhibition, and the pamphlets, some social media posts, and the posters. Yeah, that was fun. Well <laughs> Leah? Hi. Yeah, hey. <laughs> What's up, everyone? <laughs> Um, I, I was wondering, could you, could you tell us more about your, your project? Because uh, what we're seeing in the exhibition, right, the Center for Post-Capitalist History has this like larger manifestation kind of throughout your, your artwork. Um, can you talk yeah, a bit more about that? Absolutely. Um, so the Center for Post-Capitalist History is a project that I had started in grad school. Um, it actually started out as a conceptual writing project called the Archive of Scarcity. Um, and that was basically kind of this very futile attempt to try to catalog um, kind of the different accretions of an experience of um, being lacking resources, I guess. Um, so that kind of ended up turning into this more, um, I guess, broad kind of um, digestion of these topics. Um, so I ended up making this parafictional museum. Um, so it has one foot in reality and one foot in fiction. It takes a lot of our kind of inherited issues that are happening um, geopolitically, um, environmentally, and kind of tries to envision um, how a museum or an archive might deal with that in this kind of unspecified future after cat uh, catastrophic climate events. Um, so a lot of the conversations about cultural resources um, and even considering human
human beings and communities as part of that big picture um, is a huge part of CPCH. Um, it's got a kind of number of different um, forms and mediums that it manifests itself through. Um, I consider myself the head of preservation programs of CPCH, um, so it's kind of this fictional way that I kind of chew up and digest my own historical subject position. Um, so. The video and the flag and the pamphlet that are in the show, um, the video is kind of the easiest way to digest it. Um, it's an introduction. It kind of presents the viewer with this um, mission and the subsidiary branches, um, and it glitches into this advertisement for a biotech product that's similar to like a 23andMe, um, but it promises an accurate approxim approximation of any individual's um, lifetime monetary worth. Um, so it kind of tries to piece together um, some of our both global uh, economic issues as well as the environmental issues we're experiencing and how those things can coalesce. Um, and it kind of attempts to situate the viewer using this video in this parafictional world um, and begin to unravel this narrative of how um, the realities of our inherited future might be dealt with in uh, ways that kind of end up being satirical um, at times and uh, you know sometimes poignantly uh, accurate. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's CPCH. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I have a bit of a follow-up question, but also for for my students, like one thing in the exhibit that we did not anticipate that was that there was going to be two flags. It was something that you know seemed to come out of nowhere. Um, could you talk a bit about that, like the choice to like make a flag as part of your work? And then there's this very, I think, um, yeah, like incredible kind of image in the video, right, of the flag planted. Yeah, I want to say um, it's on Flagler Beach, maybe. Yeah, it yeah. is on Flagler okay. Beach, actually. Um, so I hadn't ever visited the museum, and that footage was taken um, back in 2017, and then again, um, like, you know, last year. So it was kind of very um, apropos that you guys would invite me to be part of this exhibition, and it kind of came home a little bit. Um, so the flag. Um, for me, there are kind of some... Uh, changing ambiguous um, loaded symbols with that um, red flags I've seen throughout my life I grew up in Florida um, they're hurricane flags um, they're also just this kind of overarching symbol of uh oh like we're in trouble something is happening um, and then there's also kind of been this interesting um, I feel like confusion with the color red and it has this ambiguous kind of loaded political meaning on kind of either end of our given um, binary political system. Um, so we see it both as, uh, you know, red scare as well as MAGA hats. So I find it to be this kind of interesting um, loaded symbol of ideology that can go one way or the other um, and doesn't really set itself um, as anything other than this alarming blood bright color that really captures people atten people's attention, it makes them angry, it makes them kind of feel things. Um, so the flag specifically in the exhibition though, um, so CPCH, part of the vision of this uh, museum is that it's itinerant, so it would be forced to be moving all around different places due to uh, climate disruption. Um, and part of the flag would be kind of this signal that people could see from far away um, that this institution is here for the time being. Um, so that was kind of part of the vision of it. Anywhere the flag is set up is uh, a kind of an itinerant CPCH uh, staging area. Um, so being able to bring that in and then create this kind of world building um, museum that can exist in a lot of different forms using that as kind of a, like a semiotic cue almost um, to its existence. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I think there's a lot of kind of ambiguity around it, but also it's a, a signal of uh, both alarm and the presence of this institution, kind of. Um, so yeah, flag specifically. <laughs> Shelby, Katie, I'm wondering, and I'm sure everyone is wondering here. Uh, so we went from 125 submissions to nine pieces. Do you want to walk us through that process and how you selected? Uh, we watched a what, lot of videos. We, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be honest, it was a lot of chaos in the classroom because we had everybody be like, no, I love this one, and like trying to fight for that one piece, and then you'd have other people be like, no, no, we need this one, and it was just, it was a lot. I know there was one piece in particular I fought for that there were some people, including Belichick at a time, was not digging, but he, he came around. I convinced him, Which one? but it was um, Shadow Swells. 
I had to really explain my point for that one, but... Will you tell us about if you talk about that? Oh, yeah. Guess, so, yeah. Shadow Swells, when you go into the exhibition, it is in that first room straight ahead of the loop of, I believe, the four or five videos or films that we have going. It is the one where you see the Polaroid, where the fish appears, mm -hmm. but then the shadow gradually comes across mm -hmm. the fish. I just felt like that was just a great example and kind of metaphor for climate change in general because I feel like our exhibition really talks about how as time progresses, we're seeing our environment diminish and seeing things that we're used to being affected. And I feel like that change over time, while it may seem gradual, it's much faster than we think. And it's a pretty dark change. So, so yeah. Katie. Sure. Um, I'm a little biased on my favorite piece from the exhibition. It was Star House by Christiana Caro. Uh, she shot a picture, it's a diptych, so there's two different photos, of um, water up to the doorstep of a house in Tangier Island, Virginia, which is really close to where I'm from. Um, and it's, going, it's predicted that it's going to be one of the first communities to be completely submerged, probably within the next 20 years. And being from that area, it's incredible to see how much of the coast has actually gone. I remember the beach used to be like, 200 yards long and now it's like probably 30 feet so that really hit home with me and I kind of fought for that one. <laughs> well, what I also love about Star House as well is I feel like that's one piece um, that really kind of I guess speaks to viewers about how it impacts local communities and people um, mm. because I think that that is a big issue with climate change as well. You know people who have means are able to kind of I guess kind of, I guess, control what happens to their life when things like hurricanes and floods happen, but people from lower socioeconomic classes, they don't necessarily have the option to do that. And I feel like Star House really highlights how low income, low socioeconomic mm -hmm. communities are affected by climate change as well. It's not just the environment, but it's also the people. Yeah, and that county in particular, it used to be one of the poorest counties in Virginia, and we just don't have the resources to keep up with the amount of destruction that we've seen over the past couple of years. It's really disheartening. I also am a huge fan of Center for post Capitalist History as well, and kind of going off what you were talking about with flags. Um, you know, over history, we've seen that flags really speak for themselves, um, what they stand for, what they mean, all of those type things, the colors represented, and particularly in art, I know we've definitely seen the significance of flags and how they rally people together, how they divide people, and I think that incorporating the flag with your piece as well really kind of, I guess, emphasizes the power that flags have when it comes to disturbance whether whether politically or honestly in everyday life you know depending on people's beliefs people's ideologies you know they're a big part of culture and representing who you are as a person so i'm curious yeah barbara i i'm not sure i'm remembering correctly but I, I don't know if any of you watched Samantha B, the comedian we were talking about. I think she did a piece on Tangier Island, and she interviewed the, res the reporter that she was working with, interviewed the residents, and asked them what they thought about climate change. They don't believe in it. That's what I'm saying. That's exactly <laughs> no, what the I'm mayor, saying. Yeah, I'll so they were, it too. They, and so that's what struck me when you were talking about it, is that the people who are most affected by it don't believe in they don't believe in it. It's not a, even a belief system. It's just an understanding. You know, yeah, it's an understanding. And so communicating this through art, I think, is one of the languages that we can mm -hmm. use. I really firmly believe that as a scientist, because our spoken, our written communications don't always resonate yeah, for sure. um, but by any means. And I, I know this from teaching students from all different majors. And, um, but our, I think whatever way we can reach them, you know, and that spoke to me, that Tangier Island piece spoke to me so much because the people who are most affected are, don't even believe in what's causing it. Yeah, like the education system in a lot of rural America is so poor that like you don't even talk about climate change. And oh, we have a lot of abstract pieces in the exhibition that kind of dance around the theme. 
and then like ties everything together. But that is so literal, you don't need to really dive that deep into it to understand what's going on, which I really liked. This is this is one of the things that struck me as we put everything together is how the just kind of the breadth of the uh, styles, right, of the the work. Um, and how each of them are trying to sort of grapple with the same idea, right? But come out with such kind of disparate outcomes. Um, I'm curious, uh, Barbara, Lori, Leah, which which of the works sort of spoke to you in the exhibition? I'm going to be honest. I think it was Leah's, and I'm not saying that just because she was sitting here. I, I think it was just really, really powerful. I know that part of the beach well. Maybe that's part of it. Is you know, I've watched it over the 20 years we've lived here. I've watched the changes, um, watched the erosion, watched the yeah. So I, I think that's. <laughs> um, I also feel like the, the star house diptych was very, um, I mean, I think it's just compositionally a really awesome photograph. Um, and at that kind of scale, it lets you kind of um, dive into it a little bit, um, not literally. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I think I agree with everything that you guys said to contextualize that. Um, I find that piece to be really powerful. And also, like, I don't know, something about a still image that doesn't require the... Um, investment of time with video that can kind of, I think, present itself as a little bit inaccessible to certain audiences that aren't well versed with interpreting contemporary art, mm -hmm. like a still image, a photograph that's really striking and simple and on its face digestible within that first couple of seconds that is a lot of the time the only um, attention span people will have for a work of art. I think that's really um, powerful. So I'm a big fan of things that can be um, <coughs> taken in like that, like a very on the face of it quickly, um, but then also, you know, given context, provide a little bit of a window into other experiences. Um, but there kind of has to be that punctum to get you into the piece, and I think that definitely has it. Um, that being said, I'm a huge fan of video art, so I'm excited to like actually go through and um, spend a lot more time with all the longer durational pieces in the show. I would, I would say the same. Um, I was engaged with several pieces for different reasons, but for the same reasons you were saying, I find your work so engaging and complex and um, provocative. And But as a, as a person who's interested in cultural, the intersection of cultural and natural resources, it was that diptych as well. And partly, again, because of my familiarity with Virginia and Tangier Island and its significance as a cultural place, it is a historic fishing community. It's on an island. Um, it's, a, it's a place where um, the oldest type of English language that... The Hoi uh, Twitter accent. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it, it, is, it is, in terms of language, those intangible aspects that we talk about of cultural heritage exist, right? And so um, the loss of that, and, and again, that's because it is on an island. It has been isolated historically. And I think, too, that in terms of cultural heritage and these kinds of projects that we're doing and, and what happens and tying into your question of economic resources, how do we turn, uh, how do we transition these ideas into how people don't believe in climate change or they don't, fishermen competing with leatherback turtles in Trinidad, um, and slaughtering them because they get caught in their nets and they, they damage their equipment. How do we change that? Well, it's largely through the efforts of local, locally-based, community-based projects where there are cultural brokers who get involved, like a, a woman named Suzanne working in Trinidad and this rural community. She came in and said, started just arguing and fighting with fishermen on the beach because it, they're from her community. So they were more willing to listen to her. And she got people to think about how these turtles, let's think about them as our community, as our economic resources are diminishing because of the impact to fishing villages. How can we start an informal economy that is based on tourism and women's groups creating um, crafts from, tra they call it trash to cash, that kind of thing, like turning glass bottles into trash and getting people to get involved in development on their own terms, transforming their economies on their own terms, and becoming invested in the natural and cultural resources to their own benefit on their own terms, which I think is fascinating. Uh, and saving, saving those resources, um, like the intangible aspects, and tangible aspects, like those houses, the structures that people are living in on Tangier Island. So to me, that's, that was a really compelling piece. Thank you. 
One thing that kind of, I guess, struck me when we are discussing right now is that before we even started this exhibition, you know, being an art history major, you know, you learn of, you know, your typical art pieces. You never really kind of, I guess, circle around art and climate and environment. Um, so that was really new for me in this exhibition. And it was really interesting to see how, I guess, climate and environment can tie into things such as uh, Leah's work, how it kind of talks about how do we preserve history when all of this is diminished, you know, because coming from a public history background as well, we talk about historic preservations and the issues that we're going to have in the future. Um, and it, it was just really interesting to think of how art can represent that, that I guess I've never really seen before in all my years studying. So, I'm curious, this is a local question, right? Um, where or how do we create sort of space for you know, exhibitions like this or creating art like this or conversations like this moving forward, right? So this is not a, uh, a, a one night only event. Mm -hmm. It's an open question. I mean, it's hard to like, to just talk about things. Like we can make a hundred exhibitions and nothing could happen, but it's really just like educating people. Um, I know oftentimes like, with politics will blame a lot of people for being uneducated about climate change when we should really be holding accountable the people who are super educated and manipulative and are exploiting people below us. So I think it really starts with just uh, stirring something in people when they care, they'll do something about it. So local events would be great. Well, and also we kind of touched on the subject. I feel like we need to make contemporary art more accessible to people who mm -hmm. aren't necessarily familiar with kind of the abstractness contemporary art can be and make it more digestible so that while we have art for art's sake, we also have art to where it can be understandable for all viewers at points, so. Yeah, I mean, I think personally, part of my investment in visual arts is um, almost hijacking the uh, visibility of this kind of um, bourgeoisie establishment of um, ideology and using that to express the urgency of certain messages um, using uh, mediums and channels of uh, distribution that have higher visibility under the systems that are using those channels to uh, launch similar ideological campaigns on the opposite end of the spectrum. Um, so I think that's a big part of my project personally as well. Um, and thinking about like kind of almost in a situationist international esque use of detournment, um, how we can take the these huge channels of um, distribution and visibility that we have access to and use those to um, maybe look for other ways out. I think involving local artists could also be a great great channel too, because we're not just plopping an exhibition in a random space, which is not what I'm saying we did, <laughs> but um just making it publicly visible and tie back into the community and people will care a lot more. There's like a, there's an Orwell quote and it was, if there's any hope, it lies in the polls and it starts with community and works its way up. So that's where we gotta start. Um, Barbara? So. Yeah, I, I wanted to say that I think that, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of ripping off of what you were saying about politics and um, I, I think people care. I think that art is a great way to um, really get people to care viscerally, um, uh, you know, challenge people and make them think. And I'm no artist, so I'm, not, I'm speaking out of school here entirely. But once you get there, I think it's a call to action. You know, I think that you have to bridge that I care to what do I do about it. And I've got like this, uh, this is a visual. <laughs> you guys read that Can everybody yeah. see that? <laughs> I can't read it. And there's 58 different projects that the city of St. Augustine is undertaking, they just got $26.5 million to try to address flooding, climate change, resiliency, and, and protecting people's cultural heritage as well as their natural heritage. And that's the call to action. What do we do with this? What do we do with the caring? I'm not ready to give up. You know, I'm not ready to abandon you all and say it's your problem. <laughs> I'm not ready to do that. And, and I think that we do have solutions. These are obviously reactive solutions. You know, what the city is doing is reactive, but it's proactive to what's coming in our, in our um, not too distant future. But the real thing is what do we do about 
the, the corruption and the, you know, the loopholes and all that. Uh, the only way I know is politics right now. That's, that's why I got into it, um, because I, 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 I do want to do something about it, and I kind of felt like um, I had tried everything else. So, um, <laughs> so this is my last-ditch effort. Um, but it, I, I voted for you, Barbara. <laughs> 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 but the, the point is, is that get engaged. Like, like however we can, we can bridge that, that the, the connect, make those connections between all the ways that we care, all the ways that speak to us, and then what do we do with that? How do we make a change? Um, and I, I don't usually give my opinion at events like this, but I did kind of want to chime in here because um, a lot of the climate scientists that, that I speak to, they say the number one thing you can do as an individual to fight climate change is to talk to other people about climate change. Uh, and, and I firmly believe that's the case. So I think this is where you all come in. Uh, and this kind of gets to, to Katie's point from earlier. I think one of the main uh, barriers we have uh, and that's getting in the way of, of significant action is just education. I think if there were more people out there who understood what was happening and, and what it meant for us as humans, uh, I don't think we would be having these conversations. I think we would have been pursuing these solutions a long time ago. So I, I think if we all just make a more concerted effort to go out there to talk to people, to make sure our friends, our family, our coworkers are aware of what's happening and how we can fix it, there will be more demand for events like this. There will be more demand for the kind of content I'm, I'm trying to create and adapt. There will be more demand for art exhibits like this. I, I think that is one of the best ways for us to, to make progress and, and to create more content like this. Yeah, back to you, sorry. <laughs> Pretending to be a panelist for a second. <laughs> I don't know how to segue from that, you know? That was beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> just um, made it up just now. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I can top that. <laughs> I think I, think I want to see if there's some questions uh, out in the audience. Yeah, we can do that. Uh, we got people ready? Um, so I, I, think, can, can we, I think we can use this mic. I just want to make sure our, our virtual audience can hear you guys. So if you don't mind just coming up and you can ask your question on this okay. mic here and we'll, we'll do it. Uh, I saw two hands up here. Um, yeah, you want to go ahead first? Maybe wouldn't mind just kind of share your name, where you're from, and, and, and then let us know who your question's for. Uh, I might have a little mark on my face. <laughs> I don't see anything. I think you're um, my name's Aria McKenna, and I'm originally from Gainesville. My family's been based in this area for about 26 years or so, um, and I work in climate, so I uh, appreciate guys are putting this together. Um, it's a very scary time, and so especially for the younger generation, thank you for showing up. Um, <laughs> and so that's just a little background because my question kind of connects to this, is I've been working with scientists around the world who have <laughs> so I've been working with scientists around the world who have a different approach than the one that's currently being utilized that goes beyond mitigation and focuses on drawing down greenhouse gases um, and planetary brightening measures because the planet has been darkening when you look at it from outer space. And that's in direct correlationship to the warming. So those issues haven't really been addressed by the international community. It's very complicated. Um, I can't get into the depth of it right now. So that's just a little background for my question, which is with what the city of St. Augustine is doing, I'm wondering if they have anything in there that focuses on brightening measures, like even painting rooftops white, for instance would be a helpful thing yeah, people could we, be doing everything. We have a number of sustainability initiatives that um, would include that, yeah. Anything to lower the um, urban heat island effect? Yep. Yeah, that, anything to reduce that. Uh, and I hope to see those start to be implemented in our building code. They're already in our comprehensive plan. And so I hope to see more of that. Okay, and I would love to follow up with you. I'm sure I have additional questions about, and I look forward to learning more about what's being done. Yeah. I, I would actually call um, people's attention to a website that I think 
I don't know if you want to bring that up, um, but the city does have a pretty com comprehensive website. And I'm going to call out Jessica Beach, who's our chief resilience officer and the entire um, team of staff that have been so successful in doing so much with so little in such a short period of time. Um, but this, if you go to this website, that's a place to start. Um, it does have links to our comprehensive plan. Uh, and um, it, it, I just type in City of St. Augustine Resilience and it comes up on Google. Um, but uh, there are, if you scroll down a little bit, you can see all the different um, categories and programs and funding and all this other stuff. Yeah, and um, I, so there's just a wealth of information in there. It's a central clearinghouse. It's a great place to start. They were very encouraging to me about talking about climate change. I mean, we all feel like, oh, most people don't believe in it, so I'm not going to talk about it. But it's actually an encouraging thing. Um, yeah, so, so the question has to do with uh, polling, looking at where people stand on, on their beliefs about climate change. And I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but I, I do know they, they basically put people into five different categories. One is extremely concerned about climate change. That's like the, the high end. And then the low end is dismissive. Like they, they don't think it's happening. And basically what the, the data shows is it is a very, very small percentage of people that don't think it's happening, that, that dismiss the science. Mm -hmm. Most people are on the higher end of that spectrum where they, they understand it's happening, they understand humans are causing it, and, and they understand that it is an issue we're facing. Uh, and, and I think that's important to know because I think a lot of people are, are kind of afraid to have conversations about climate change because they assume the other person is likely to not believe in it. Um, and that's almost always not going to be the case. Uh, is that what you're, you're, you're asking about? Yeah, sorry. I don't know the exact numbers off the top of my head, but... It's it's very yeah the, that that. Mm -hmm. Way more, way more. Yeah, if you talk to someone about climate change, you have like a ninety percent chance that they at least understand that it's happening and it's a problem. I saw this quote recently. It was like we should stop asking people whether or not they believe in climate change versus if they actually understand it because it's not Bigfoot, it's science. So I thought that was funny. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, and, and uh, apologies in advance, uh, focus is kind of four other words for me. Uh, so there are so many things, important things that you all have said. Uh, but um, speaking to that, that bit there, and coming in defense of Sandy Island a little bit, because I was there in September doing research on climate change related research like this. Um, and I think their ideas on it, and, and most people I, I think, including here in Florida, their ideas on it are more nuanced. Than just not believing it. Um, and how we talk about it, people who work in the field, I think has a big effect on the broader action around it. Because I think that um, what I've seen is people disbelieving in climate change is often used as a reason not to tell you. And because of that, I think that hardens the belief in the big time. So in Sandy Island, they are looking at these figures of not being able to exist without intervention in the next 20 years. Uh, but they're seeing people say, sorry, there's no money for it. So they're in kind of catch 22 as far as their belief. If they believe in climate science, then they have to abandon their, their existence that they've lived in for seven, eight, nine generations. Um, so I, I think the way that we talk about it when we work on it has to also embrace those nuances. Um, yeah, uh, so that was one thing, and I guess, I'm interested because so many of you work in art, um, which I, I believe should be a big part of this. How, how can we use that to uh, be more of a united uh, rather than putting people into these different camps? Well, 
I am not an artist, so I don't know that I'm I should. I'm not an artist, but I have an idea about that as a material culture person, as an archaeologist. And I've done a lot of collaborative work with archaeologists, which is how I ended up with artists, which is how I ended up here. I have a lot of respect for artists. Um, my daughter and her father are artists. Um, but uh, for instance, um, I think one of the ways that art can be so evocative and one of the reasons it's so compelling to people is that, and again, that image that we're talking about, it, for better and worse, strips away identity politics, right? So people, when you add in identity politics as someone who studies African diaspora and indigenous populations, people have stereotypes that come into mind. So if you want to get people to feel something about something, sometimes the best representation is, for example, 18 pairs of children's shoes, right? Without any identity politics added to that because we can all relate to children. So I think we were seeing some of that and some of the climate art that is out there. And art has always been on the forefront of promoting social activism. And I think that's one of the reasons because it, it gives people, when we're talking about epistemologies and ways of knowing things, it's not just um, science, but there are other ways of knowing things and with trusted others. Um, and I think that art can help us make those connections um, in a way that, again, as I said, for better and worse, can strip away identity politics so that you can get people compelled and interested first, and then bring in those other components, those other components that they might think that they disagree with because they're stereotyping other people. I think the reason, like just coming from that region, the reason everybody is so against outsiders coming in is because they're always spoken in a very condescending way. It's like, how are you so dumb that you can't see that this is going on? It's like, well, why like, why do you treat people like that? And we need to make accessible art. And art, the art world can be so pretentious and so inaccessible to everybody else. And uh, I think we can often live in that little academic bubble, but we need to come outside of that and be more realistic about like, the intentions behind the pieces that people make and how we display them, especially. I mean, I think artists also have the ability to create meaning through the channels um, through which they are communicating as well. Um, so it might not even be about um, directly communicating this message. It might be about how you cloak the message. Um, also kind of considering not just artwork in terms of fine art or stuff that you'd see in a gallery or a museum, um, but considering visual culture and all of the images that are kind of being circulated that are causing people to believe certain things about climate change, which things have access to the higher distributed channels. Um, so for instance, like just how much airtime a certain news channel might have um, to present people with stories and opinions that go against um, kind of this more dense, less approachable research. Um, so as an artist and being somebody that thinks about human desire and image Images, um, and how I can present, you know, meaning in that one kind of instance, um, like how something as huge as the Anthropocene or um, kind of um, human engineered climate change could be um, presented to people and also how people are kind of considering their own relationship with these things, um, kind of, I'm you know, thinking about uh, the idea that carrying around glass straws is going to do anything to stop BP from continuing to poison the oceans is kind of farcical. Um, but kind of uh, getting to the nitty gritty of it, I guess, and showing people um, what the actual relationships are could be powerful. Um, I don't know. I'm Barbara's mother. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm interested in getting the ideas across to the population. This is all fine and good, but this is a college. And some people would be intimidated to come to the college to listen to something as important as this, because obviously it, it affects everybody. So I would think that maybe we could go to places of worship. I don't know if that can be done. I don't know if the church and state is, but I remember going to a democratic rally, oh sorry, whatever, <laughs> um, at a church on King Street. And it was very interesting. So the point is that we have to preach 
to the public and preach to people who may be feeling intimidated to come to a college. I, I have kind of a response as, a, as an academic um, and studying sort of art and climate change over the past you know decade or so. Um, I know one thing that I've shifted in my sort of scholarship is to be much more of a like a, a public writer, right? Rather than sort of an academic writer who sort of publishes in journals that nobody reads, right? Um, I think that's like an important part of this conversation, right? Is kind of shifting the the focus of where you're putting the the energy, right, in your research um, into the public. Um, and, and I will say, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm from Jacksonville, obviously not St. Augustine, so I'm not as familiar with what's happening down here as I am with what's happening up there. But I will say there are a lot of churches that are doing a lot of work on this. I know I care, which is. Uh, this group of, of churches of all different faiths and denominations around Jacksonville they, this year, I think they've made their priority issues related to flooding. Uh, so they are working hard and they are putting pressure on local elected officials to take action on these kinds of things. And I know uh, I went to, uh, I can't remember which Catholic church it is, but one of the big ones uh, up in Jacksonville, and they had invited a climate scientist to come speak and talk about climate change and the issue. So. I think there are a lot of religious groups that are really starting to make this a priority. Well, and another thing I feel like people can do as well is look at your representatives, look at their stance on climate change, and know your understanding of climate change, and vote based off that. Mm -hmm. The ballot is a very powerful thing, and I think that we need to really start focusing, particularly in our youth, how important voting and becoming mm -hmm a licensed voter, registered voter, how important that is to this country's future, not only environmentally, but in so many aspects. So. And looking at who is giving them money to run mm -hmm. their campaigns, because the majority of people who are like denying climate science, uh, they're, run, they're sponsored by the Core Brothers, they're sponsored by Shell, mm -hmm. BP, it's ridiculous. I mean, when you have government officials you know, saying that they have no opinion on climate change, that's an issue. That's an issue because those are the people making decisions for us. And we need to start making those decisions ourselves with the ballot box. My name is Ayalani Haleski. Um, I'm actually native from here. And uh, I grew up watching St. Augustine change and shift. Um, I think a big thing for me as a native, and an, I was a naturalist for the county for the last 10 years or so, um, is the little pieces of hope that can be given back to the people trying to do the work. So like I have to say, like one of the big things that I saw in, Trust me, I've had a lot of like same feelings of, you know, gloom and doom watching every, I mean, I grew up in Fruit Cove, right? When it was woods, you know? <laughs> but if the city or the officials can do s small things to show where they stand and help us shift, the other folks will start to come out of the woodwork. Like one example was the 33 acres that the city decided to vote on just recently at Fish Island Road. And that started with me and a couple other people just walking it, looking at the natural things, look, pointing out some of the edibles and medicinal plants, those kind of things. And it got so many people on like a social media platform. It was like seven or 800 people just joined quick. And then they proposed it. Hey, why don't we make a passive park? And it wasn't that much. I don't know what happened behind the scenes. You know a lot more than I do. But stuff behind the scenes, something happened. And immediately they were like, OK, let's do it. And I, don't, I, I think if we can start to talk and stand up and, and do those things, not, not chain ourselves to trees, none of that. that, that those days are in the past. But actually come out and advocate for our natural communities. I mean, the turtles, the, the trees, they're all, they're all part of the natural communities. They're part of us. And without them, we don't survive. It's just the flat truth of it. The other thing I would say is, I'm an artist, by the way. I uh, my background is Savannah College of Art and Design, Bachelor's in Fine Arts. Um, 
I'm an advocate for art as well, balancing arts and science. So that's what a naturalist is. It's a balance of arts and science and bringing those two together on the same, on the same field. But go out in nature. If you're an advocate of nature, don't sit inside a classroom. Go out and visit it a lot. You will be inspired. There will be stuff that will come to you that will, lack of a better term, speaking from nature, you'll be able to bring in the voice of nature. That's all I got to say. <laughs> And just to add on to that, there is a lot of scientific research out there that shows being in nature is beneficial in a lot of ways for your mental and physical health. So there's a lot of truth there. <laughs> I think it is also um, kind of something to be aware of, though, is avoiding the epistemological trap of viewing nature as a resource and something that is to be preserved for future use. I think that was a big error with Teddy Roosevelt's kind of creation of the park system to begin with. Um, it wasn't being framed as being something indispensable to human life. It was being framed as resources that were being kind of cordoned off for later use um, for human consumption. So I think there is kind of this fine line of preservation in the immediate sense and yes using the term resource can be a way to communicate that to the people with the power um, but I think it's also just like there are epistemological things that even the people that are on our side quote need to um, unravel a little bit just I mean coming from the thornier um, arts philosophy kind of tangle um, but yeah I don't know if that's a very useful thing to talk about but there you go <laughs> I guess I'll hand over here. So um, I really have to say I like the ideas there. It's just kind of coming together like a you know, weaving of a fabric, just based on what you were saying. My name is Mimi Vreeland, and um, I work with my coworker Ellen Castle at A1A Solar. My background is in landscape architecture. I've done a number of programs here in St. Augustine over the last 26 years and really seen it change. I'm not a native, but my daughters are natives. And uh, I really th think that watching my two daughters grow up, one is more scientific. She's a numbers girl and the other woman is an artist. But just watching how they're the same thing on a lot of levels because everything you've been talking about tonight has to do with the powers of observation and just as the younger generations are growing up and being allowed, hopefully, the flexibility to decide whether they want to observe nature in an artistic way, in a very you know, expressionistic way, or in a kind of a you know, true scientific recording uh, of what's going on in a standardized way for people to understand the change over time, I see a lot of opportunities for people in the communities, like the schools, starting with kids, to be able to um, start some programs. I don't know if that's possible, Barb, but um, if there's a way to work with the higher education and you know elementary schools, and even you know starting at preschool to put together more programs that are funded to bring kids out in nature and work with artists and scientists, and that. Everybody can work together to record over time changes that are happening because you're measuring the impacts that are going on over time. But what are we left with other than the possibility of allowing children growing up to see the change and then decide for themselves what kind of emotional impacts those are creating for them in terms of loss? And if there's a way that you know, we can all work together to record that, even though there, you know, we may not be able to do much about it, um, just historically being able to record that loss for people to be able to look back, I think that's the most important thing, really. But thank you. I will say that is part of um, the what Florida Public Archaeology Network does. They do a lot of monitoring. They have a citizen science project um, that they started Heritage Monitoring Scouts in 2015, and it was a six-year project, and it's ongoing um, in terms of training folks to get involved and do science. But another component of what they do is go into schools and work with groups and meet people where they are and engage them in learning um, science. So across, so I just wanted to say they're doing a really good job of that. So they're a good example, I think, and they're um, 
they're really well known throughout the country and even internationally for that work that they're doing as being sort of in the forefront of that um, approach. I feel bad I should have brought this to you, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, my name's Nick. Uh, I work, I live here in St. Augustine. I work in uh, food and beverage. So I have, it's two questions, but they're kind of part and parcel. Um, have, do you have any opinion, any research done on uh, things we can do in food and beverage to, to help <clears throat> with climate change? Because it's a very, very wasteful industry. I'm constantly mm -hmm. trying to innovate. If you have any suggestions, I'm always open yeah. to it. And I also, I would if you could talk to the importance of, or whether or not you think it's important. I'm vegan, I think that living a, a plant-based lifestyle and moving towards that is w ultimately not the only thing that's gonna help, but it will be a big thing that helps. Mm -hmm. So if you could answer both of those, that's, that's, all, that's all I got. Yeah, there, I, would, I would say that, um, if, I, if I may, um, food waste is one of the most, the biggest contributors to methane, for example. Um, and anything that we can do, to, that, that's actually something that's on my priority list. Um, Gainesville has just implemented some really um, progressive, um, I, I, I don't know enough about the details yet, but they, um, as a city, have um, targeted food waste um, comprehensively. And so what they're trying to do is redistribute the unused food to people who need it, which in this, <laughs> in this time and age right now, especially with food prices and everything else so high. So, Food waste, I think, is your biggest lever. Um, and if there's anything I can do, if we can have a conversation about how the food and beverage industry um, and the city can work together to try to crack that nut, I'd love to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Thanks. This is kind of like controversial to some people, but if you want to start doing something immediately about climate change, stop consuming animal products as much as you can because industrial agriculture is the leading cause of greenhouse emissions. I think it's what, 80% of greenhouse emissions? And um, monoculture is stripping our soil. We can't sequester the carbon that we're releasing. It's ridiculous. And we're, we're cutting down the trees so we can have more cows to feed more people to keep having kids and giving them meat. Like, it's like, it's good, but it's not good for us. Well, and, and going off that note, I was thinking of the same thing. The United States is one of the top nations who raise cattle. They're one of the top cattle industries in the world with Brazil as well. And like you were saying, having industrial farming and, and having people not wanting to give up meat because of the taste and all that is a big issue and like this whole controversy of people kind of making fun of the fact that cows do do emit methane. Cows fart. Which, yeah, they, <laughs> they do and it is an issue. It's not just, oh, well, everybody does it. No, no, it's, it's much greater than that and I think it needs to be realized. It's more. And the majority of like plants that we grow in the United States is for industrial agriculture to feed livestock. And that can be going to people who actually need a lot of food, feeding food. Yeah. Anyway. I'll, I'll say that the, uh, the topic is sort of out of my jurisdiction, right? Uh, but an anecdotal sort of uh, responses. Um, I was in Berlin a couple weeks ago. And all of the cafes participate in this like program where they uh, use reusable cups, right? So you pay an extra euro, you get a cup that you can exchange at any other cafe and just kind of reuse it uh, seemingly endlessly. Um, and I know the the AMP has a kind of similar program, right? And that seems just like a it, it seems so obvious, right? As yeah. soon as you sort of mm -hmm. participate in something like that, that that's that's a way to solve a lot of waste yeah. issues. Can you ask the question, when you run the cup, are they they give you the cup and you keep it. Yeah. And then to that point, it just since you brought up Germany, Germany, if I'm not mistaken, uh, implemented a tax on meat, uh, meat consumption, to try to uh, dissuade people from consuming meat to you know cut down on it. If you have anything to say about that, if you think that would be a good thing, uh, is it Cory Booker who was running for president? wanted to do something similar and they got a lot of pushback on it and ultimately obviously wasn't nominated. Um, if you have anything to say about that as well. 
Um, so I will say, yeah, it is true. One of the best things you can do as an individual to lower your carbon footprint is to, to go vegan or, or vegetarian. Um, but and not to sound like a broken record here, but I think this also gets back to that education uh, thing. Because uh, when you start talking about using paper straws instead of plastic straws, people get really mad about straws. <laughs> yes. Um, deal with everything. And, First world problems. Are and, and I think this is just another example of why we need to do better about educating people about these things. Because I think people just don't understand sort of the, the issues with these practices that we've just gotten used to that just make things so convenient and they mm -hmm. and they're afraid of losing that convenience yeah. so i think that is the first and probably the most important step to, to getting to these issues that you're talking about because yes these would all be great ways for us to reduce waste and, and to help lower the carbon footprint of this country and to do all sorts of other great things but there's just so much uh, visceral like reaction to it people just don't they don't want to be inconvenienced in any way yeah well, I also kind of want to add to that point. I think also healthier vegan lifestyle food needs to be more accessible to people with lower incomes. As Plus. you know, people with lower incomes, they can't afford the high prices that organic, healthy, vegan, vegetarian products, they can't afford that. So, of course, they're going to go and get meat, which is much cheaper because it's mass produced. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that that's an issue. I think we need to lower the price of foods that are actually good for people, good for the environment, and if anything, raise the prices for the food that's not. Uh, and, and it's not just an issue of affordability either. It's, it's, it's an issue of physical access because we have food deserts all over in this country. Uh, there are so many people that just don't have access to fresh, healthy food. Uh, so they almost have no option but to, to get things that are not good for them and that are not good for the environment. Yeah, I deal with that. I'm currently opening a bar in Alaska, and my only food option, if I'm busy, is Taco Bell, which is not great, but it's the only vegan option out there. But I went to a sushi place the other day. But to to that point, yeah, food access and the accessibility in food deserts is is a major major issue. But when you see it in the UK, they just and they've gotten a lot of pushback on it. But Burger King recently uh, made like a singular location all vegan and I think it was a trial one they're doing it for like a month uh, and they got, they got a lot of pushback on you're like whoa I want my freaking burger I want my Whopper and it's like but just get the veggie one so yeah it's hard because right. it's so deeply ingrained into our culture too yeah. you know well especially in Florida being a cattle state we have been a cattle state for a long time and so people are used to eating hamburger yeah. I think also just like not demonizing ranchers in general and teaching them a sustainable way to grow crops and to grow livestock so that actually captures carbon instead of just stripping the land yeah. because they don't want to feel alienated they don't want to feel like they're bad people because they're not there's a farmer i think in the uk that does a regenerative farming cycle and i, I don't remember the specifics off of my head but um his carbon I think he's carbon neutral at this point. Mm -hmm. So if, if we're going to continue that in animal agriculture, then we at least, bare minimum, need to move toward that and stop with the factory farming and the abuse of the All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. I know that we're kind of getting started with this, this panel and you know, working with Flagler and the artists and the investors Tonight, it's sort of a microcosm um, of kind of a thought process that there's a way that we can help each other expand on that, starting, you know, with here, now, Flagler and cities and lobbying for the city commissioners, and implement over time. I don't know uh, what kind of things you can do, but green city uh, opportunities there are. For City on some level, or some kind of a you know, come up with a name where we can kind of show people as a city, you know, of uh, intellectual and also accessible component, you know, for people that uh, are in poor communities that receive the same opportunity to be able to have a park program to kind of understand how to kind of take care of their own city. Even though you know we're within a larger county within the state, uh, so our, our, you know, we're trying to our hands are kind of 
kind of some level, you know, and you could go on forever as an argument, but, but where do you start? This kind of question? You keep adding to it. Renewable, recyclables, being new in, so where do you even begin so that you can actually start to have an impact over time? And if it, you don't feel like you just can spin wheels, like I know from our standpoint, we have been doing it in the solar industry, we get talk all the time about well, what happened after 30 years and what do you do now? It's like, well, God, we've got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. We've got to figure out. I mean, you know, tonight we were kind of like picking up our plastic cups and plates that we were using to do some of our food off of. And like, well, where do you begin? So you feel like you're actually making a difference. Um, Can I call up Flagler College real quick since I'm graduated? <laughs> since I've graduated. <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> um, well, just specifically right now, uh, I remember whenever I was a freshman, I would we didn't have any recycling receptacles in the dorm, so I would like bring it over, and then I stopped doing that because I saw that they were just throwing it in the trash anyway. <laughs> so holding at least the school accountable could be a start since this is where we're having the event. But also community gardens would be an amazing opportunity. Um, it could help connect the community to like first of all where the food comes from, caring about nature and also providing them with something to eat, especially in lower income areas. I did see, yeah, if you wanna come up, I saw your hand earlier. You, mind? you can answer there if you don't. <laughs> okay, it didn't back up, but I wanted to address your, um, your, your comments about bringing in people to the and how you get um, the average person to even have awareness, have a conversation, and Controversial. I'm, I'm coming to Florida, and I'm going to come to work, and I'm going to work um, primarily to hear what is going on about coming in Florida. Okay. But I went to Jacksonville um, Farmers Market during the year ago, and I was part, and I love Farmers Market, so I'm going to go home. But that one had a lot of informational booths, um, and it was more than just food, but I learned a lot about. Composting and you know, a lot of different things, and just wanted to suggest that you know, maybe more about this process could be provided at a farmers market because there's all kinds of people at the farmers market, and many of them, you know, come back and see your signs and maybe they do. I learned a lot just right here, even about me. I, I have no <laughs> idea that, that you contributed to the things you did. Secondly. Um, regarding uh, changing the, the, the eating behaviors in Jackson, I mean, my son um, lived outside of Philadelphia and was selected to be an urban farmer in a very um, intimidating town. And part of that was participating in the community. I mean, it was sponsored by the town and so on people see from this organization who said, just plant the food and give it to the community. People became a little intimidated and uh, and these are all changes. And that is just another suggestion on the um, you know, the so many different companies that talk about uh, areas that you want to be doing to, to um, support urban development. It also just gives you such a sense of pride too to grow your own food. It feels so good. And I think that would connect people back to the community more and caring about what happens to it yeah. in regards to the effects of climate change. Was it was it the Riverside Arts Market you were talking about? Yeah. 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 I love the Riverside Arts Market. If anyone's ever in Jacksonville hasn't been, go check it out. I think it's every Saturday. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a farmers market. I can't remember. Is it every Saturday? Yeah. Yeah. At the yeah. Amph yeah. at the St. Augustine Amphitheater as well. So if you'd like to check that out, it's a fantastic <laughs> Hugo's muffins. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting also framing all of this from like a mutual aid perspective. So something where rather than it being from a charity perspective where you're some kind of like overlord um, philanthropist giving to some community in need, um, rather you identify your own community, you meet those needs, and you and then have a long-term stewardship with these actions that kind of keeps that as a cycle going in the community um, rather than this kind of like one and done um, like industrial magnate style Rockefeller-like um, philanthropy. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's, I think, I don't know, just like rethinking those paradigms might be a way to change the way that this kind of the whole conversation has cycled over the last 20 years. 
a citywide composting program would be awesome. Wait a minute. Okay, we have one. <laughs> <laughs> we have one, and we gave away, I think, 50 compost bins for free in the first two hours or within the first day. So we're, we're there. She you missed one. it. But it's coming back. <laughs> but we do have one, and we're expanding it. Awesome. Yeah. I was, I was going to say, too, yeah, I think going back to your idea about getting the schools involved earlier on, again, I, we were with students on a study abroad in Trinidad, and we went to a rural community, Matlot, and we went to the schools, and they have a teacher who teaches agriculture. So the class that we were working with, they were teaching them about primary tillage, secondary tillage, and so the students were actually each taking turns rotating in and doing that from the very beginning all the way to the end, all the way to market um, with plants and also, sorry, with animals, um, <clears throat> with chickens, so that they learned how to raise chickens and, yes, slaughter them, which our students were very upset about. But um, then taking them to market and figuring out, you know, again, getting people invested in that process. So they were learning from a very early age um, what this process is like and what it means for them, um, which would be nice to see since, you know, maybe it could replace since we can't read anything right now in Florida, we could do agriculture in our classrooms. Um, I, I think we might only have time for one more question. So if there's anyone who, who hasn't posed a question yet, I want to make sure to give you an opportunity. Do we have anyone else? Yeah. I heard somebody say that down in Fargo County where I'm at, maybe it's not a little bit. They said that it's difficult to get people to actually pay attention and care if they're not if they're not somehow engaged into some kind of form of anything. Now some people gravitate towards learning in academic settings. I know I'm one, but not everybody feels that way about academic mm -hmm. So it is a culture kind of thing, and uh, I know when I was a kid, we had Jock Cooper. If we wanted to watch yeah. Disney, we had to watch Jock and show. And I was recently curious, and I just looked up Jock Cooper to see, you know, if I could find any old videos. And one of the things that I realized that I probably didn't take too much attention to as a kid was he was saying that he's seen a great depletion of the environment in that time set. So I can't imagine what that kind of great depletion would be at. But I know that I paid attention because I cared, because that was the program, the quality of the program. So that art, right, that artificial environment, that, that infrastructure, that communication part, and how it impacted me is a big part of the political economy in this attitude. Because there are some people that are kind of rural kind of folks, you know, my family's rural, and they want to think in terms of, well, you know, that's selective sampling. What they're doing over there to our disease point, we've got to change. we got to want let me tell you what to do. That's their attitude. And so I think the idea of how do we get that conversation going, because you're right, I, I do believe I've heard people say it, you know, do you talk down to them? Mm -hmm. uh, or are, do they feel that they're being talked down to them? Is there some kind of strange codependency going on here <laughs> that we really don't understand? So I know that I have a project. And I've been trying to get, I guess, kids to somehow express themselves using the internet in a positive way. But it seems difficult to get traction, you know, with whether it's civic leaders, you know, where I live, or, but I'm, I'm fortunate I've got an employer now that stands behind me writing this little thing with <laughs> professional development. And so the question is, is when I think about what the military looks at is the military says that any time that a subject is actually adapting to their environment, whether it's artificial or physical, whatever, right? Anytime they're doing that, they're learning. So is it appropriate discussion to say, 
when we have an artificial environment or a physical environment affecting our kids, that this is what we're going to keep them for to the point that we're seeing chaos from beyond our control here, that change and things like that. There's a time to sit down and have that discussion and say, this is a broader aspect mm -hmm. of climate control, but it is about care mm -hmm. and somehow working together and serving. My mom calls it a come to Jesus meeting whenever you have a conversation with someone you don't agree with in a respectful way. So I think just talking to people respectfully about the climate crisis, if they don't believe in it, um, is the best route to go because it feels good to talk with people who agree with you, but it's more correct, correctly? Uh, <laughs> I swear the degree um, to, <laughs> to speak with people who you don't. So. Um, I also, kind of going off what you were saying, your Cousteau was like my Bill Nye growing up, you know? So I totally, I feel what you were saying about connecting those ideas and concepts to younger generations in a more entertaining way. Um, and I guess I, I would just add to that. I think, I, I think most of us probably understand why, but climate change has kind of been turned into this like heated political issue when it's not. It's, it's, a, it's an issue of science. There, mm -hmm. There's no politics here. Um, but because it's gotten that way, whenever you bring it up, if, if somebody kind of identifies with sort of that tribe that is sort of a, against like accepting the, the, the science of climate change, they're going to get more combative. So you have to approach the conversation kind of knowing that's the case and you need to make sure that you are finding a way to identify with that person and, and sort of lay out shared concerns because even if they don't accept the science of climate change there will be certain things that they care about they'll, they'll be concerned about how these symptoms are affecting their friends and family and their community mm -hmm. so if you can kind of get into those and start the conversation from that point i think you're more likely to have success than if you you go into it and as soon as they say something as soon as, soon as they say something negative you're like what no what are you talking about mm -hmm. climate change is real you're, you're wrong you know you, you got to go in and you got to be empathetic and you got to try to see things from their point of view. Which is very hard on it. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> Extremely hard. But you get better at it over time. <laughs> I, I would actually um, just you know, follow up on what you just said, Brendan. Um, if you start out with climate change as the two words that you will start the conversation with, um, it, it's not very successful. But if you start with the word flooding, you got everybody. If you, got, if you start with the you know, word fire, drought, water, I mean, I don't, there's no debate there. So let's not, we don't have to, I'm, as a scientist, this has been really hard for me to not use that term climate change, but I almost never use it now when I talk to people. Yeah. That, it's, it's a little bit squishy. <laughs> Yeah, and there's a lot of loaded terms that have been yeah. like, yeah, yeah, like given yeah. that kind of yeah. political yeah. positioning. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely think the best way is to, to, to talk about the issues themselves. So, like in in St. Augustine, if anyone's lived in St. Augustine for any amount of time, you've seen flooding, the the frequency of flooding increase. Like, I'm not from St. Augustine, but I know that saying: if you spill a glass of water in St. Augustine, <laughs> it's going to flood. You know. And as a student trying to walk to class and just having to ripping your shoes off and just go <laughs> and going into class with your jeans just soaked all the way up to your waist, you know, and, and just having to sit through a cold classroom with wet jeans is <laughs> just not tourists. not pleasant. You have tourists kind of coming by and they're like, Oh look, the drowning student. <laughs> Let me take a picture. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's definitely it's it's an issue for sure if you live here. All right, well, uh, I would love to take some more questions because this has been a really great conversation. Uh, and it's always a risk when you, you give the audience a microphone. <laughs> but, but you guys were really great, so, so thank you very much. Um, but, but before we kind of like really close things out, I did want to give each of the panelists just a, a moment for any closing thoughts they might have. Uh, so if we just want to go down this way, you want to start things out? And if you don't have anything to add, you know, that's fine. Be nice to other people and go hug a tree, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> In summary, <laughs> I just want to thank everyone who came here. This is 
a really good turnout. I honestly was not expecting this, but if you haven't seen our exhibition, please go see it and tell people about it. That's one way to kind of start the conversation and let them see climate change for themselves. I also would like to thank everybody for being here, for the organizers, for the students in particular, for all that you took on. Um, and just keep the conversation going outside these walls, you know, uh, meet people where they where they are and um, and and help them care, get them to this ex exhibit, um, but also get them to, you know, get outside and appreciate nature too. Yeah, I would I would echo most of those sentiments. Just thank you all to, for coming. Um, it's it can be incredibly difficult to get people to come out, <laughs> and yet you're all here. And I, I will note that I there's some people that I see at every single event we have here. So you're a very caring group, um, particularly enamored with our students and what a great job they did. Um, but if there's anything that we can help any of us you do in terms of participating in community involved projects or connect you to resources, please let us know and we're happy to do that. So thank you again for coming. Thanks y'all. Um, the human scale of time exists within the geological scale of time. <laughs> also big thank you to uh, Dr. Balashak. He really pulled everything together yes. and put in a lot of work. And, and Julie in and absentia. Julie, yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so thank you to each of you. You were a great panel, a uh, great audience, uh, and all the audience members, uh, keep an eye out for a follow-up email after this event. Uh, there will be a survey. Uh, and again, as I mentioned at the top, if you want to know about future events like this one, or if you want to read new original reporting on climate change, you can sign up for the ADAPT newsletter at adaptflorida.org. Um, financial support for ADAPT comes from our readers and listeners with additional support from the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation and the 2040 Foundation. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, today would not have been possible without the help of Chris uh, and Julie. Uh, so thank you so much to you and to Julie. Let her know for me. I'm very appreciative. Anything you want to add? Sure. Um, I have to say, starting this project, right, uh, we imagined having some sort of community involvement, right? And I don't think I think this this way surpasses our expectations of, of things we thought about in the classroom. So I really appreciate everyone coming here and sharing everything. Right? I think that's just uh, part of the part of the solution. Um, and a lot of this conversation has about, been about communication. And as my students said, uh, I encourage you to go back to the to the museum, uh, see the exhibition. A group of students put together a library of kind of books, right, and resources. Um, so those are there for you. Um, I, have a, I have a laundry list of people to thank, um, Brendan and WJCT, um, for collaborating on this event. Uh, I, I know there, there have been innumerable mornings where I'm just like, I cannot wait to hear Melissa Ross kind of walk me through like what is going on right now, right? Um, so I, I think uh, we all kind of really appreciate um, the service you have in our community. Um, I want to thank uh, my, my department, uh, the, uh, <laughs> I forgot my department's name. It did, cha <laughs> it did change recently, right? Uh, department of Visual <laughs> Arts, um, as well as the uh, Visual and Performing Arts Advisory Board and the Keenan Family Foundation, all of whom con contributed to this uh, event. Um, and of course, to uh, Julie, who is not here, uh, the director of Chris Bellet for for dealing with the students and I putting everything together over the past several months. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> thank, yeah, what a trooper, Julie. Thank you. Um, yeah, and thank you again for joining us. Yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. <laughs> 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 <laughs>